All right, hi everybody. This is the next in a series of videos of um, lectures over chapter four. Um, first, we're gonna talk about oxidation reduction reactions. We're gonna talk a little bit about solution chemistry and how to express um, information about solutions using concentrations um, like molarity, which are moles per liter. Um, first, let's talk about oxidation and reduction. Um, we talked a little bit about this in the past, but uh, really only in the sense of what are oxidation numbers. Um, and so I do want to talk a little bit about what oxidation is and what reduction is. Um, we're going to talk about how to always know which is which using a moniker um, called oil rig. Um, and here we'll see at the bottom where these come from. An oxidation occurs when an atom or ion loses electrons. And so um, for oil, we say oxidation is loss. Hello. Uh, it's not gonna let me. Sorry, this is not a good uh, slide to write on apparently. Um, oxidation is loss. And then reduction is gain. Okay. Highly recommend you try to commit this to memory. It'll help you in the future when we're trying to identify what is oxidized and what is reduced. Um, when these types of reactions happen, you have to have them happen at the same time. We're going to look at how they are typically written. Um, we've got this example reaction here of calcium and oxygen making calcium oxide. Um, and we'll look closer at some reactions and some of the rules for determining what is oxidized and what is reduced using oxidation numbers. Please do not get oxidation reduction reactions or redox reactions for short mixed up with precipitation reactions. In precipitation reactions, we have to use solubility rules to identify what is solid. In oxidation reduction reactions, we do not have to do that, but there is a difference. In precipitation reactions, charges do not change from the reactants to products over the course of the reaction itself taking place. In oxidation reduction reactions, numbers do change. Ionic charges change. And that is why we have to track oxidation numbers. And so in the next few slides, we're going to see some rules for assigning oxidation numbers, some of which you've seen before. Um, first is going to be that elements in their elemental form, meaning not charged, have an oxidation number of zero. A lot of times this is written as um, something along this in the course of a reaction and so on and so forth. You'll see something along those lines. There's no charge. It's not attached to anything. It's by itself um, and it has no charge whatsoever. Other examples are the diatomic elements like oxygen, which have no charge or chloride which have no charge and so on and so forth. Um, the oxidation number of a monatomic ion is the same as its charge. So for instance, if we look at group one metals, or two uh, metals, they are plus one, minus, I'm sorry, plus two ref, um, respectively. And then, um, or we could look at the halogens. Typically the halogens end up being minus one. So we will see examples of when the halogens do not behave that way. Um, most of the time, when they do not behave that way, it has to do with the fact that they are um, in um, polyatomic ions. So make sure you make a note that this is not always true for the halogens, the monoatomic ion rule um, in polyatomic ions. So like hypochlorite, uh, chlorate, bromate, those kinds of things, iodate. Um, next is going to be one of our major um, reminders, and that is oxygen is always a negative two, unless it's the peroxide ion, which is a very rare occurrence for our particular types of compounds. Um, hydrogen can be a negative one or a positive one, depends on what it's bonded to. So if hydrogen is bonded to a non-metal like HCl, then H would be a positive one because the metals are always positive. Um, and if hydrogen is bonded to a uh, metal, so think like NaH, then H would be the negative one in this case, um, and the sodium would be the positive one. Okay, this would be the negative one. 
just kind of practice of, with your oxidation numbers. We did a lot of this last year. Um, hopefully some of it kind of jogs your memory. If not, I do recommend you go back and you look at some of your notes from last year. I also recommend that you get online and you look at some videos um, just so that you are up to date on this stuff. Uh, next is going to be that fluorine always has an oxidation of negative one. This is useful, but only if fluorine is present. Um, so this is why I never really harped on making sure you remember that fluorine is always negative one. Um, I think it's more important that you remember that oxygen is a negative two because oxy anions are more common for us or oxygen containing compounds are more common for us to come across. Um, other halogens will have a, an oxidation number of negative one, um, but they can have positive oxidation numbers when they're in uh, polyatomics. That's what an oxy anion is. So just make sure you are tracking um, when it comes to chlorine, bromine, etc. Try to use other things to determine what that one might be in that particular case. Um, the sum of oxidation numbers in a neutral compound, so think um, something like this. Since there is no charge here, the charge is assumed to be zero. Whereas if we had a polyatomic with a charge, sorry, my numbers are off, um, then the sum of the oxidation numbers in this compound must equal whatever the charge is. All right. Next up is displacement reactions. So just kind of introducing the idea of how an oxidation reduction reaction is going to take place. Um, a lot of times these are either single displacement or they're very straightforward. And we'll talk about the two examples of each. Um, I wanna use the term straightforward carefully here because what I mean by that is that there are only two things on the left and two things on the right. Um, and all that changes is charges, okay? Um, so let's look at this example down here. Hopefully you can kind of see it at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have an oxidation number for hydrogen of plus one, an oxidation number of chlorine for negative one. Magnesium is in its elemental state, so that is at a zero charge. Um, on the right side of the reaction, the hydrogen gas, um, which is in its elemental form, remember that's a diatomic, has a charge of zero, and the magnesium has a two plus, the chlorine has a minus one. So when we look from left to right, we wanna look at something that changes charge. Here I see that my hydrogen atom went from a plus one to a zero, and here I see that my magnesium atom went from a zero to a plus two. My chlorine atom did not change charge, so I don't really care about that. Um, in redox reactions, we are looking for the change in charge. A lot of times this is only going to happen in metals, okay? Most of the time it's going to happen in metals. We're going to look at some examples of non-metals changing charges, um, and we'll talk about um, the activity series at some point in this chapter as well. Um, so here we have the hydrogen atom going from a plus one to a zero. Because it went from a plus one to a zero, it gained electrons, okay? And hopefully you can like reason in your brain why I think that. Um, to go from a positive charge to a less positive charge, you have to gain a negative thing. Um, and in this case, the only thing I can gain is electrons. Up here, we went from a zero to a plus two, which means this thing lost electrons. Okay, and if you remember our moniker, oil rig, an oxidation is a loss and a reduction is a gain. Um, my gained electrons is the reduction my lost electrons is the oxidation, okay? Um, and that is just our first example. We're gonna look at a couple of these. Here we have the oxidation, and this is one of these straightforward reactions I was telling you about. You either have single displacement or you have these straightforward reactions where there isn't anything obvious happening, um, but charges did definitely change. And so in order to determine the charges on this particular thing or what happened, um, we're going to go through and we're going to look at um, how we determine the charges first. So first is going to be this copper in the solid. This is an elemental form. Here we have silver. It says plus one. Um, the actual reaction is up here. What they did is they ignored what they call spectator ions, also known as the ions that don't really matter. Um, they didn't really do anything in the course of the reaction. Nothing changed. Um, up here, over here on the right, I've got a copper with now a two plus charge. 
and I've got a silver with a zero charge that is in its elemental state. I apologize. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to analyze what changed from left to right. So we're going to take the copper and we're going to look at what happened to the copper on the left on the right. We're going to take the silver on the left. And we're going to look at what happened to that on the right. So from zero to plus two, this thing must have lost electrons. Again, it went from a zero to a more positive number, which means it must have lost something negative. We always think in terms of loss or gain of negative charges um, in these types of reactions. So when we went from a plus one to a zero, we must have gained an electron because we went from a positive to a more negative state. Um, and remember that, again, oil rig, reduction is gain, um, oxidation is loss. So this guy is my reduction, and this is my oxidation. Okay. Um, from there, um, if we try to flip the reaction around, we see that the reverse reaction will not occur. Nothing will happen. And this is because of the activity series. So I'm going to remind you of the activity series. Um, when it comes to the copper and silver, you see on here that copper is directly above silver. Because silver is the thing that is doing the oxidizing in that first reaction, it must be below the thing it plans to oxidize. Whereas when you flip it around, silver becomes the thing that needs to be oxidized and copper is above it doing the oxidizing. So the oxidation, um, the reverse oxidation will not happen. Okay, And I will remind you of this over and over and we'll talk about that many, many times. But do remember the rules for oxidation and determining whether or not an oxidation reduction reaction will occur. Um, next, we have our just general definition of how to measure information about a solution. Um, you've seen this before. I need you to remind yourself how to do it. You've got moles per liters of solution. Uh, moles of solute over liters of solution has a unit of M, capital M, also known as molarity. Um, it's the way that we measure concentration of a solution. So we can have a very concentrated solution by having many moles in a small volume. We can have a, a less concentrated solution by having let, um, a fewer amount of moles in a volume. This gives us a good example of how things are um, strength-wise on the bench top. Here we have um, the example of how to make a solution. Um, in this case, we see a, an amount that has been weighed out is going to be added to what we call a volumetric flask. On these volumetric flasks, you probably can't see it very well on this diagram, but there's this little line. That line is an exact volume measurement of how much liquid this can hold. So for instance, a volumetric flask that comes in a 100 milliliter volume, if we add this um, our solid to this flask and then we fill it to this line with water, I know I have added exactly 100 milliliters of solvent or I have diluted it to ex exactly 100 milliliters of um, solution. So this kind of gives us a good example of exactness, the exactness science um, that we will be using in different labs. You'll see that I put out solutions that are certain molarity. Um, those have been made a specific way using a very, um, using the tools that I have at my disposal. The next thing we can talk about is how to dilute solutions in order to make a less concentrated version of a solution. So for instance, we can take a um, diluted solution or a very concentrated solution that's indicated here by this darker blue color. We can move some of it over into a new volumetric and then we can dilute that to our mark again, changing the total volume of that smaller amount of solution. And in order to figure out what the new uh, molarity is, we can use this particular um, equation. Um, now you see MC and MD. Um, in the past, we referred to it as M1V1 and M2V2. Same idea. In this case, they use C as the concentrated and D as the diluted. Um, I use ones as initial, like what you started with, and twos as the final. So like this is what we want to get to. Um, M's stand for molarities, V's stand for volumes. Um, M should always be in moles per liter and V should always be in liters. Um, if you have V's um, in both milliliters, you can also use milliliters. Um, but just make sure that whatever you use on the left is the same unit on the right. 
All right. Um, so when we talk about stoichiometry and all of those lovely things, we've talked about this in the past quite a bit. If we want to go from molarity to moles, we have to use the volume of a solution in order to get rid of the liters um, on the bottom of that equation. If I want to go from moles to volume, I have to use the molarity of a solution um, in order to get there, right? So this is where we're saying if we have moles per liter um, and we multiply by liters, we get volume. If we have um, a molarity in moles per liter or we want to get there, we can take moles and divide by liters and that'll equal our molarity. If we want to go from moles of a substance to grams of a substance, we know this one. This is straight stoichiometry. You've done this uh, about a hundred times in your head, you've done this about a hundred times on paper. I know you know how to do this part. The only thing we're adding to our chart is how to interpret um, using the molarities. Okay. Um, next is going to be titrations. I am going to skip titrations for now. All I want you to know about titrations is that this isn't a technique. We are going to use this in like, I think it's chapter 17 or 18 um, on acid base chemistry. Um, for now, all you need to know is that the goal of a titration is to identify the molarity of an unknown. That makes sense. So that's, this is like a technique we use. And we're going to talk about titrations, like I said, just not until next semester in depth. Um, but basically the goal is just to identify the molarity of an unknown solution. That is all you're doing here. And you do it in a series of ways. You involve something you know the molarity of, which is usually in this thing called a burette. We put the unknown down here in the, in the uh, Erlenmeyer. And then we add slowly but surely an amount from the burette into this unknown. We have to use an indicator in order to identify what's in there. Um, and we know the exact volume in a burette. And I'll show you one of these in class. Um, but for now, that's it. You guys have a great day. Enjoy your long weekend. Um, see you Tuesday.